or you um or you're also welcome uh we'll have some q a left you know time left at the end so either way is fine with me um just a little bit of background on me i am absolutely fascinated by networks um so i've definitely like drunk the juice and uh and so there might be things that are obvious to me or or that I, I take a second nature that you're like, well, what do you mean by that? Um, so please feel free to, to point out some of my, my blind spots in terms of some of the some assumptions I make about what you might know or how you might think about, um, about how you connect with others. And, uh, and I've been doing this mostly in the context of uh, venture capital and startups, right? So I've worked with uh, Anthemist for a number of years, which is a, mostly focused around the financial services and insurance startups, as well as Atomico, which you may know is a, a generalist firm. And so I'm very familiar with how uh, networks are driving outcomes within the startup ecosystem, um, in the context of fundraising, in the context of building teams, in the context of the founders and boards and making decisions, and obviously in terms of the growth of those, those organizations. So, um, so you can ask me questions at, you know, related to any of that. Um, all right, let's let's dive in. Um, so first and foremost, when I talk about networks, well, what am I talking about? So I'm a very visual person, and so I like to think about it in terms of how they typically visualize this information in the field of network science, which is with dots and lines, right? Which are nodes and vectors. And so in this situation and all of the diagrams that I show you today, the dots are going to be a person or an organization and the lines are gonna be some relationship between those two dots or those two people or those two organizations. So that's how you can sort of read the diagrams that I'll be sharing with you. Um, and uh, let's get started. So it's not only what we know, it's who we know. And I know we've heard this a ton of times and we maybe intellectually understand it, but we haven't totally internalized it. And I just wanted to give you a couple examples of how this plays out in real life. And these things, obviously, you're thinking about them today in the context of your startup or your organization or you personally and your role in that organization. But you can also think about that in the context of your whole life, your relationship to your family, your friends, your community, wider society, right? So these things are applicable in, in, many, um, in many, many contexts. Um, so one of the papers that I find fascinating that, uh, is often uh, referenced in the context of diversity is who we know influences what we do. And it's called the daughter, the daughter effect. And this basically the paper showed, and it's from um, Paul Gompers and Sophia Wang from Harvard Business School. And they basically looked at VC partners in VC firms throughout uh, um, I think it, it was predominantly US was the base that they looked at because that's where they had the data from. And they said that they found that the if a VC partner had a daughter, right? So in their family structure, they had a female, they had a daughter and, um, at home, then they were more likely to hire a female colleague and therefore likely to generate more successful venture capital returns, right? So here is a very bizarre scenario where actually the shape of your network and the, the people that are in your network are driving outcomes in ways you absolutely wouldn't expect. And um, this is really important and powerful in the context of, of female entrepreneurs, or, or I would extend it even to underrepresented founders from any background, because if they if the firm has somebody who sort of looks like you in the firm, they are more likely to consider you as an investment, right? Which is one of the reasons that um, there's so few investment to female entrepreneurs um, is because there's so little representation of female um, venture capitalists. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting uh, example of, of how the network is, is driving an outcome in a very unexpected way. Um, another one that I think is really interesting is called The Adjacent Possible. And if you guys have read the book, um, Stephen Johnson, Where Good Ideas Come From, you might've heard of this before, um, but the idea, it comes from, so Stuart Kaufman is a um, evolutionary biologist by training. And what he basically said is that everything that we know to be possible derives from what we, you know, what we're exposed to, so our network, right? And um, the 
and this is both true for truly novel innovations, right? So if you're creating something wholly new for the world, that this this rings true, but also if you are um, if you're just thinking about things that are novel to you. So if you're the founder of a startup and you are aware that something exists, then you are able to access that thing that exists. But if as a result of your network, you do not know that a certain thing exists, then you are not able, it's as if that thing is unknown to you, right? And so this is another way in which who we know influences what we know and therefore what we believe is possible. And I'll give you a very personal anecdote related to this. Um, before I ended up in venture capital, I was working in Hong Kong as a, um, basically in product development. And I kept on telling people in my network that I wanted to be to startups what a producer was to boy bands. And so now this is very commonly known as venture building or venture studios, startup studio, you know, you have Antler, you have um, EF, et cetera, et cetera. But at that time and in Hong Kong, nobody in my network knew of anything like that. And so to me, it basically didn't exist. And they would say, oh, well, since that job doesn't exist, what are you actually gonna go do? Until I actually met somebody who was aware they had come from London, they were familiar with these types of models and they said, oh yeah, there are companies that do that. And suddenly something that was not possible for me became possible because I was then aware that that thing exists and I could go get a job in that space. And so you can imagine whether that's grant funding or access to a particular type of market opportunity or understanding a particular use case for your product, the, the network that you're a part of and the exposure that you have influences what you know that you can do and also what your business then could do as a result. Um, so again, another great example of the way the network is, is driving an outcome for you in ways you probably didn't anticipate. So let's transition that to who we are influences who we know. So, and the, the challenge is obviously we cannot choose the circumstances in which we're born into. We have a certain set of genetics and uh, religion and class and race and gender and, and et cetera that influence who we are. And that actually in turn influences who we are likely to know. And so there is some uh, very clear research. This is called, the, the original paper is called Birds of a Feather, as you can imagine. Um, that we hang out in networks that are what they call um, like very homogeneous or, or, or have a high homophily is the word that they use in the, in the um, in academic papers. But, um, but they found time and time again, studying all different types of networks and all different types of contexts that networks will tend towards being homogeneous. First in terms of race and ethnicity, then in terms of sex and gender, then age, religion, education, so in that order. And so you are a sum of the people you're spending time with, and those people often reflect your beliefs, your, um, your values, your experiences, et cetera. And so in order to create diversity of thought, diversity of perspectives, diversity of, um, you know, just just get access to different ways of doing things, you have to proactively seek diversity in your networks. It will not come by accident. It will not come um, just naturally. And so this is really important when you're thinking about innovation and certainly important when you're thinking about how do I represent the customer base that I am targeting, right? So if you are a bunch of people of a similar age and you're targeting a, an age group that's vastly different than yours. So potentially uh, a much older population or even a much younger population or then, then getting exposure to people who, who have that perspective becomes really, really important because you're not embodying that within, within your organization necessarily. So um, this is a really important um, concept within in network science and certainly that has a huge knock on effect in terms of organizations, um, startups, their success, their ability to, to access markets and deliver, deliver products that actually reflect um, uh, the needs of their users. The, um, so as I said before, you know, the way this shows up, the, the, the positive thing is obviously you start with a particular um, set of conditions that you don't have a lot of control over because you're born into them, but then you also, choose certain family roles, you 
achieve certain types of education. You choose to learn certain languages. You choose to live in a certain place, be a part of industries, have certain hobbies. And so there, we are all very, very multifaceted. And that gives us access to networks that we might not otherwise have access to. And so this is the means by which you can find common ground and access uh, individuals that have different perspectives than, than you have. And um, and people used to laugh at me, but I I would say to people, I am proactively seeking older friends, right? Because I found that living in London, um, it was so easy to make friends with people that were between 20 and let's say 50 years old to make friends with somebody who was 70 was actually really hard. And so I actually made it a proactive effort to go out and, and um, and make friends with people of that demographic because I wanted to include that perspective in part because I was far away from my family and I didn't naturally have access to that like you might if you were a part of a large family. But um, but also because it was very helpful for my work because I was focusing on building businesses in the longevity space and understanding the, the experience of people as they're approaching retirement and beyond was very important to my work. And so giving me that exposure was quite a powerful uh, Tool for me. So, so if we if we kind of come to accept that it's not only who we know, or it's not only what we know, it's who we know, then I'm going to ask you then to step beyond that and say, okay, it's not only who we know, it's who they know. And what I mean by that is that all the connections in the network matter, right? So if you think about um, on the left, me here, that the, when I think about my own network, and let's say um, I think about me as a founder and all of the members of my board and all of my employees and all of my customers or whatever, I think about the one-to-one -one relationships that I have with each of those individuals. But the reality is that those people have relationships that are independent of my relationship to them. So all of my employees, they know each other, all of my board members, they know each other, all, uh, you know, if I have a pilot that a few customers are going through together, they all know each other. If I'm part of an industry association for a particular um, uh, sector that, that my business is focused on, then many of those people will know each other. And so all of those connections collectively drive outcomes for us as individuals and our organizations. And so we have to take those into account and not only think about our individual relationships with those, with each of those people or those organizations. So how does that practically work? So I'm gonna give an example that's not from the startup space, but, um, but uh, a, a space that I think we can all relate to. So this work, which is from Janice McCabe at Dartmouth College, um, looked at the academic and social success of undergraduates at a large universities in the US. And what they found was that basically, um, that college age students, and well, most people, but it happens to, you know, a lot of research is undergraduates, as we know, um, they would basically, their, their friend networks would fall into roughly three categories. So the first one is what they call tight knitters. And that basically is, so if you're A, let's say that's Alice, Alice has a bunch of friends and all of those friends know each other. And so you can imagine her network being sort of like a tight knit ball right, of yarn where everybody knows everybody. Um, the compartmentalizers, so let's say Bob in the middle here, um, they are more likely to have two or more friend groups. So let's say they have their friends they play football with and they have their friends that they study with and they have the friends they go out on Friday night with, whatever the case may be. And those people all know each other, but those groups are independent of each other. So they are compartmentalizing their networks. And this might look like a bow tie or a four leaf clover, or it takes on that sort of shape, right? Um, the third category is what she calls the sampler. And the sampler is where you have one-to-one -one relationships with people, but they actually don't know each other. And so that shape looks more like a daisy. So you are the common denominator in the, in the among those that group of people, but those groups of people do not, or those individuals don't have relationships with each other that are independent of you, okay? And so she followed these people as they um, went through college and watched what happened to them academically and socially. And what she found was that the, um, that the compartmentalizers and the tight knitters were by far the most common types of networks, but that the tight knitters had a certain um, 
uh, I guess certain situations would unfold for the tight knitters, right? That if the tight knitters were among a group, so let's say Alice is among a group of friends that really supported her academic success. So they encouraged her to study, they helped have study groups, they would wish her well on her tests, they thought that studying was important, whatever the case may be, um, then she would have incredibly good outcomes, right? So she would have outsized outcomes because she had a social support network that was really supportive of her success. But if she had a group of people that were undermining her success, who were saying, let's skip class, oh, don't worry, that test isn't important, who cares, Let, let's go out drinking, what, you, you know, what have you, then actually these people would underperform and were the most likely to drop out of university. And so uh, you can imagine that that's actually the structure of the network is playing a huge role in driving outcomes for that person individually. Whereas the person, Bob, here in, in the middle, if they were getting a lack of support from one group or lots of support from another group, they could choose to spend more of their time in one group or the other. Um, and they could basically uh, balance those different uh, dynamics in the groups so that it didn't have an outsized impact on them. So they were the most stable. They didn't necessarily get the best outcomes, but they minimized their downside. So you can see how, let's say, I, I mean, you might look at these now and think, oh, well, this isn't related to me, but let's, think of um, a board, right? So if you're on the board of an organization, your company, and you have what you would describe as groupthink, the experience that you're having is of Alice, that group A, right? Where everybody is thinking the same way and therefore they are blindsided by something that they couldn't anticipate because they had graded this echo chamber. And so these networks show up in many, many different contexts and you have to be very careful about acknowledging when that might be occurring. So um, this other research, which is cool, which thinks a little bit more, I mean, it depends on the size of your organization, whether this, when and if this becomes relevant, um, but this work uh, is also, well, it was written up in Harvard Business Review, but I think the work is from Harvard um, as well. And they basically looked at sort of the network shape signatures for different types of activities in an organization. So value that it's the organization is creating in different ways and what sort of um, people structures optimized for those that sort of value creation. And on the left here, you can see that somebody who has more of that, that daisy or that sampler um, type of shape was very uh, successful at ideation because they have access to many different groups of people and their perspectives, right? And there's not a lot of redundancy or overlap in those, those ways of thinking. Where on the right, the efficiency, so that again, that tight knit, that ball of yarn sort of network was really great for getting things done very efficiently because everybody was very aligned and on the same page. And so that, of course, if the group was undermining each other's success and not wanting to be uh, efficient, you would have the worst of those outcomes. But you could see here how the sort of shape of the network is uh, is influencing the the ability of those individuals to be successful, providing what it is they they want to do. All right. So, how does this impact startup land? So, this is a really interesting work, um, and this is from Queen Mary University of London. Um, and basically, what they did is they looked at the co-employment history of the individuals who worked for startups. Right. So. Imagine this, you basically take the, the leadership team at a startup and you say, okay, where are all the places that they've worked and who else worked with them at those places who are also founders of other startups? And they built a big map of all these relationships of all the people who used to work together. And they found that people who were more central and, and startups that were more central to that map, that overall map of all of those startups were more successful. And they were more likely to be connected to, they were, you know, ex Airbnb or they were ex Uber or, you know, all the, the, the big successful startups that you, um, that you're familiar with, those people were more concentrated towards the center of the graph and those startups were more successful. And you could argue that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because uh, those people are getting access to the capital um, and they know certain people you, and you're absolutely right, but that's sort of the name of the game. And so it was interesting to see how this actually became a predictor 
of, of startup success. And I'm not necessarily saying go hire a bunch of people that are ex Airbnb uh, necessarily, but, uh, but I think that the point being is that the people who are part of those successful startups have access to the network of people who are successful and know how to survive in a startup that's growing and therefore also support actually the knowledge sharing and the transfer of information that's really valuable to that new startup as it as it's progressing. So um, anyway, very, very interesting research. But so with all that being said, um, there is no such thing as a perfect network, right? Because we're always balancing these trade-offs. We want to be efficient, but we want to innovate. Um, we need to control our size and we have we can't manage tons of relationships, but the more relationships we have, the more access we have to different opportunities, ideas, et cetera. And so we're always balancing these things over time. And so one way to think about that is, so from the perspective of diversity, the, often the way I explain this is if you have a very homogeneous team, it is easier in the short term because everybody shares the same language. They all are very familiar with each other's behaviors. They don't have to um, explain themselves, you know, communication is very easy, right? But but you might end up with with the sort of group think that we described before. And the that the other end of the spectrum, if you have an, an insanely diverse team, so let's imagine here that um, every single person on your team spoke a different language, right? So you have somebody speaking German and somebody speaking Chinese and English and Russian and, and right, it'd be very, very hard to get things done with that level of diversity. So they, they have this thing called the diversity bandwidth trade-off, which is basically like at some point it becomes so hard to get anything done that it becomes unachievable, right? So you, you need to find some balance there. Um, but if you can harness that diversity, so if you can find a common ground, then that actually will be much longer, uh, much more successful in the long run because that um, that organization can anticipate things, um, the uncertainty, the change, you know, the macro changes in um, in in the economic situation, the 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 changes in trends, whatever the case may be, because because the exposure that they have and the diversity of that exposure is is likely is likely to be broader. So in terms of size. You can think about it as, and you could think about this in the context of a board. You can think about this in the context of a team. Or you can think about this in, in response to your wider network that supports you as an organization. Obviously, a smaller network is easier to maintain, but a larger network means there's more chances that someone can help. And anybody who's gone through a round of fundraising knows you need to talk to a lot, a lot of people in order to get a few checks. If you had a very, very small network, that would be very challenging. But then if all of those people invested and you had to manage all those relationships, that would be really hard. So you're always kind of this pendulum is swinging back and forth between these, these two um, realities. The next one is what we just spoke about, which is density. So if you have that daisy-like sampler network where there's not a lot, a lot of redundancy and not a lot of people know each other, then that means you're gonna be exposed as a heuristic to more novelty, more diversity of ideas, more diversity of perspectives, more new opportunities, right? So that is really, really valuable when you're sort of in the explore phase of, of whatever you're doing. On the other hand, it, when the density is more, is, more um, is, is higher and there's more interconnectivity among a group of people, then that's a more resilient, um, uh, I guess, network structure. And so if you're really needing to buckle down and execute, you want a team of people that are committed, that are the same, that are consistent over time in order to support that, that goal, right? So you can see again, in which scenarios, one would be more beneficial than the other, but the, that it's very hard to have both at the same time, but, or, but you need them both for different contexts, right? So um, how, and again, you know, there are so many different examples of these types of um, uh, these this type of research and these types of uh, I guess examples of network structures and the impact that it has in different contexts. So if you're curious about 
um, one that might be relevant specifically for your business, I'm, I'm very happy to have a separate conversation about that. I just wanted to pull a handful of examples that, uh, that tend to resonate when I give these sorts of talks um, and that pique people's interest to then go and explore where it might be showing up for them in the context of, of their work or their organization. Um, so in terms of practically building and cultivating relationships, um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about four different ideas that are maybe a little less typical than like me saying, hey, like just go to a cocktail party and hand out business cards, right? So here are um, ideas that are, I think are really valuable and that um, work for people regardless of whether you're an introvert or extrovert or depending on the nature of, of, of what you're doing might be more or, or less relevant. So um, we'll go through them one by one. But of course, first, a little diagrams to help you mentally picture how these things contribute differently to, to the outcomes that you're looking for. So if you have a bunch of stakeholders, like, like let's say for your business, you have a number of stakeholders that you're having to engage with. If you generate content for them, then you're building sort of this, this one-to-many um, relationship where those individuals don't necessarily have relationships with each other, like a community, but they have a, they're building a relationship with you as an individual, as a thought leader, or maybe for, with your organization. Um, if you're harnessing a super connector who is somebody who's very, very well connected, then you're accessing sort of their first degree and second degree connections, which can be very powerful for helping you reach um, individuals that you don't currently have in your network. Um, and then, of course, if you're joining communities, then you're getting to situations where you're meeting people who may also know each other, and there's more resiliency in that group. And that's really great in terms of, you can imagine, um, uh, like, uh, you know, professional associations, for example, or um, subject matter expertise, you know, getting that from, from a community or a group of people who, who share the same interests, share the same goals as you. Even a peer learning network for fellow founders, something like the Health Foundry, obviously, is an example of joining a community. Um, so what I find a lot of introverts prefer is creating content. And one of the reasons that people like this is because it's sort of like sending out the bat signal and saying, hey, I'm interested in X. And you rely on the inbound of people who reach out to you because they liked your blog or their your podcast or what you wrote on social media. And you basically let the other person take the first step. And um, there are a number of people who, who find this strategy very successful because there's already a filter of those people clearly want to have a conversation with you because they're interested in the same topic and you're not sort of like randomly connecting with people where you're you're uncertain about whether there's going to be something interesting that you share. And so whether you do that through a blog or through a podcast or through a newsletter or even just sending email updates for your organization, they're all great ways to do that. And I think it's more about finding the, the means that works best for you or that you feel the most comfortable um, doing consistently over time. Um, but that's, yeah, it's a great strategy and it works really well for, for a lot of, I mean, introverts and extroverts alike, but particularly for introverts, if they don't feel comfortable working a room and in, in the classic, uh, in the classic um, social networking sense. Um, the next one, as, as I briefly mentioned before, you know, Health Foundry being an example of that are joining communities. And now there are just so many of these sorts of communities that are available online that, uh, and many different tools in order to access those communities that uh, it would be really, uh, it seems silly not to at least to take advantage of some of them. Um, so there's the classic sort of meetup.com, uh, meetup there's you know Slack and Discord communities, a lot of communities now that WhatsApp has a community function. Um, there are a lot of communities that are just staying on WhatsApp and they found that very, very successful. And there are a handful of um, communities that have um, used specialty tools like Circle or Mighty Networks to, to host their communities. Um, I, I find that those probably, when they work, they work great, um, but they don't work nearly as often as the ones that are um, you know, on Slack or, or on WhatsApp. Um, obviously, not any two communities are the same because 
human, you know, humans when we come together in groups are complex and adaptive systems. And so you can find some that are dead and you can find some that are very, very lively. So obviously you want to find one where you really feel at home and you feel like that you're getting the information and engaging with people um, that's, that are valuable to you, right? That really help you. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit, I mean, you, you, there are things you can look for that I think make that easier to spot. Um, but uh, but it is a little bit trial and error. Find one there it, that it it really works for you. Um, the the one that maybe and I, I do this because I'm really thinking about this all the time. So I know in my network there are a handful of people where in fact I have this one um, chain of introductions that I think is maybe like eight people long or nine people long where somebody had introduced me to somebody who then introduced me to somebody. And so, and just like, I won't call it like a third of my network, but certainly a large chunk of my network has stemmed from that one seed and all of the introductions along that path have been very fruitful. So if you're in a position where you can harness somebody who has a wide network, um, then that can be very, very powerful. And that doesn't necessarily, um, that could be as simple as you're attending and let's say you're attending in a, a conference and you've never been to that conference before, or you're attending an event and you've never been to that event before. You could just walk up to the organizer of that event, who is the super connector in that context and say, hi, my name is this. I'm interested in X. Who specifically at this event do you think I should meet? And what's great about that little hack is they know everybody in the room, right? And they're, because they're the sort of person who hosts events, they're the sort of person that wants to build those connections. And so unless they're crazy busy running around because something is wrong, they are probably gonna say, oh yeah, you should meet this person and that person and this other person, and actually maybe even have, take steps to proactively help you find those people. And so this leveraging people who, who sit at that um, sort of exchange or at that hub in a particular network can be a way of shortcutting your way to, to finding mutually beneficial uh, relationships. Um, but of course, you wanna be clear about what you want. You wanna be very respectful and responsive. You wanna be efficient. You don't want like, you want to make the person who's making that introduction like look good, right? And, and also I always will write or, or go back to the person who made the suggestion and say, thank you so much. Here is the outcome of, of the introduction that you made. And thank you again for doing that. Like every super connector really, really appreciates um, when individuals close the loop because then they know, oh wow, that person isn't very responsive or that person was hard to schedule with or, oh wow, that they, those two really did have a great conversation. So I was right to suggest them. And so that feedback loop is, is very powerful for the, for the super connector as well. Um, last but not least, um, and this is really, really common in the, um, in the venture capital space, but I, I don't have the impression it's quite as common in the startup space, but I figured I would mention it. So, what I think is a total under underappreciated tool is the recurring calendar invite. And the reason for that is if there's somebody, let's say it's a, a peer mentoring relationship or no, a, maybe a more typical mentoring relationship um, or a really important customer that you want to keep, um, keep tabs on, creating a recurring calendar invite makes it so much more likely that you will continue to engage with that person over time because the friction associated with creating a new calendar invite and scheduling a new meeting every time you want to meet, it, that, that friction tends to reduce the number of times that you meet over time. Whereas to reschedule something that's already in your calendar for whatever reason behaviorally is much easier. And so putting those things in your calendar such that you that you can on a regular cadence, engage with that person that you would like to engage with, reduces your effort, reduces their effort, and actually maintains the relationship more successfully over time. And so I think this is great for individuals. I also think it's great for communities if you're trying to build those, but uh, just such a simple thing and totally underutilized. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I, I, I highly recommend you try doing one. In fact, so much so that, I would say 
if you only do one thing off the back of this presentation, here are the things that I would recommend you do. If you're right now trying to build new relationships and you go to an event or you go to a conference, I would ask the host who you should meet. So just try that little hack and see what, what comes as a result of it. If you're cultivating existing relationships, set up a recurring calendar invigate invitation for that relationship. So maybe that's the chairman of your board, maybe that's um, a peer founder, maybe that's your customers, maybe that's a key employee, whatever the case may be. Just set up one recurring calendar invite and see how that changes the dynamic for you guys. Um, and, it, and if you're not, not a people person, although I imagine if you chose to sign up for this, this talk, you're probably already drunk the juice at least a little bit. Um, I would read one book about networks and I'm happy to make recommendations for, for books about, about this uh, topic, but I would just try and get a handle on all the different ways that this shows up in your life and the importance of, of it in your life. And maybe that will make you think about it a little bit differently. So that is all the content for today. And I would love to open it up to questions. So I am going to stop sharing screen and I am going to, there we go. Um, Does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> or thoughts or comments yeah. or experiences that they've had? Uh, hi, Erika. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, in terms of network, uh, do you have any recommendations on software to map networks? Say, I do. The, the, the diagrams that I see quite uh, like visual. So both uh, for a person who is probably not a coder, just sort of simple hands-on, but also probably uh, if you know of other uh, software that have say API driven net interface where programmatically you can control it. So both of them. Yes. Um, so I'm throwing one into the chat that's called kumu.io. Mm -hmm. um, that one is really good for um, like you can do network diagrams with lots of data. You can do network diagrams where you just are manually putting a handful of people, you know, mm -hmm. on a map. Um, you can also use it to do system diagrams. So that one is quite a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. And they have a free version. Um, you have to, your project has to be public, mm -hmm. um, but they, they do have a free option. Mm -hmm. Another one is called Graph Commons, which I'm putting into the chat now. Um, so that one, similar, maybe not, as elegant uh, a user interface as, as Kumu, but mm -hmm. similar in terms of it's um, helping you graph. Um, there are others that are a little bit more academic uh -huh. um, and a little bit more technical. So I, I, these are probably the two main ones that I would recommend. Um, mm -hmm. but, the, but I would say the, the thing that's tough, mm -hmm. um, and I always, I always say this to people because people get excited and they're like, I'm going to graph my whole network and I'm going to, you know, get generate all these insights about what my, you know, my network shape is. And I say that that's great. Why don't you just start with a very simple exercise mm -hmm. of making a map of the people you've spoken to in the last week. Mm -hmm. Right. So don't try and boil the ocean. Yeah. And I, I actually do have a, um, let's see, a blog post where I talk about this. Let me see if I can pull it up now. Um, but the, the main reason for this is it is so, if you're not technical, it is quite hard to get all that relational data into a format that's mm -hmm. easy to make the diagram mm -hmm. and people get so bogged down in trying to get every last bit, you know, they want all their LinkedIn connections. They want everybody they've ever emailed and they want, mm -hmm. you know, their entire family, right. You get the idea. <laughs> yeah. And and they basically just don't ever do anything. Mm -hmm. Whereas similar to what we eat, who we spend time with is quite habitual. Like we probably mm -hmm. spend over the course of a couple of weeks, most of the people that we hang out with on a regular basis, we probably mm -hmm. see them. And so if you just start with that and you mm -hmm. get a sense of what that network looks like, mm -hmm. then you can say, oh, I'm 
probably a tight knitter, right? Or <laughs> I'm probably yeah. a sampler or I'm, you know, and then that uh, will already give you some idea mm -hmm. of how you might want to um, modify your, your personal network in service of mm -hmm. whatever your goals are. Got it, got it. Thank you. Thanks Does that a make lot. sense? Yeah, thanks, thanks. So just a follow-up question on that. So uh, so these tools, I, I imagine they are for, say, one individual who wants to map their own network. Uh, but coming from the point of view of, say, a software builder or a product manager who is building a, a product around networking, say, who wants to uh, help other people map their networks, are there tools we can integrate into a software product uh, uh, in case you know of any? Yeah, I mean, there is, there's some. Okay, so, I, and I'll give an example from the healthcare space. So mm -hmm. there is a guy, um, his name is Dr. Amar Dehand. He's mm -hmm. also at Harvard. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like over-indexing on Harvard, Harvard in this presentation. Um, but uh, he, he basically studies strokes. Mm -hmm. And he found that the social network of the, mm -hmm. of the person who's had the stroke Mm -hmm. had a huge impact on whether they got the treatment they needed in time mm -hmm. to address the the serious issues that they had, right? And so his conclusion was basically in everybody's medical file, there should be a map of their social network and mm -hmm. that the doctor should be using that as a tool to support diagnosis, okay. right? Or treatment plans mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Um, and uh, and I think there, there are some tools that help people um, and one that comes to mind is is one called Network Canvas, which I'll also put in the tree. Mm -hmm. um, that help you do that. However, I think in most situations, mm -hmm. pen and paper are probably fine. Okay. Or, you know, using Keynote or using Power, you know, PowerPoint or Google Slides or like it doesn't you're probably not doing the level of analysis needed mm -hmm. to justify using a software tool. Uh -huh. um, so I think it can be fairly low tech and I appreciate Got that it. this is, you know, not what people want to hear, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. but I think that that um, in, in a lot of cases that does do the job. Sure. Got it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. Okay. I see something in the chat. Some people offered to help during a Zoom call and first time never got back call either. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is a great, I, I, and I think, uh, I think you're right that people, um, that oftentimes people over promise and under deliver. And so if you can be the sort of super connector or just individual who just does what they say they're gonna do, oh my gosh, are you ahead of the game in comparison to most other people, right? Um, I think that uh, that oftentimes what I do is I will do one follow-up and I'll say, like, it was really kind of you to offer if like you really don't have the bandwidth right now to, to, to help in this way, like, it's totally fine. Just let me know one way or another. Um, and, I, and if they don't respond to that, then I usually just leave them be. Um, but, uh, but I think the behaviors, the funny thing about human relationships, um, is it, it's sort of like the best way I could describe it is we now have a book about sleeping and we now have a book about breathing. We have all these books about things that we thought humans just did well, you know, right out, you know, right out of the gate, but it turns out like there's a better way to do all, all these very basic functions. And I think and and that people do it all sorts of ways uh, in ways you wouldn't expect. And I think socializing um, and social interaction is another version of that, where it's like you think because you do it a certain way, most people do it that way. But the reality is that the way we engage is so varied. Um, and so um, it's hard to make any sort of assumptions around social interactions. Um, and uh, yeah, and as a result, you have to uh, acknowledge that there are going to be people that behave in ways you don't expect. Uh, I wondered if I could ask a question about the super connectors. Uh, first sure. of all, thank you so much. It was really, it was really interesting. Um, kind of 
presentation. I guess I've kind of jumped the juice a little bit myself as I find these things really interesting. Um, I just wondered, you know, from what you were saying about the super connectors, I think it's a really great position to be in. I just wondered if you could share a little bit more about what we can learn from super connectors, if there's anything that we might be able to implement in our kind of relationships that could um, really broaden our horizons. Yeah, so I, so as, I mean, I wouldn't describe myself as a super connector, but other people describe me as one. Um, and I think what uh, what I benefit from being in that position in the network is that the um, you're sort of like the switchboard, right? And so you're pr you're you get Sorry, access to information and I trends will. and um, ways people are thinking and behaving. You know, like you just you can do the pattern recognition across a um, a group of people because you're sitting in that position where you're seeing the exchanges. Right. And so I find it quite a powerful um, position to understand how things are changing, sentiment is changing, what what emerging trends exist, that sort of stuff. So for me, it's, it's quite a powerful position to be in because I value that that role. Right. Um, and I think people who sit in that position, they really thrive off of facilitating those interactions. And so oftentimes here is an example that is a little counterintuitive, but um, there are, you know, it's sort of like, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. If you want to get introductions, yeah. a super connector is really used to doing introductions all the time, right? And so they're really efficient about it and they know how to do it and they know how to elicit a response. And so you could ask them for 10, 20, 50 introductions and they are gonna process them much better than an individual who's only does them every once in a while, right? And so I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's that both the value that that individual gets, but also the the efficiency that they have as a result of doing it all the time, um, makes them just a really useful person to have in your network. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Oliver. Yes. Sir. I can't. Is that somebody asking a question? I think that or is that somebody talking in the background? background? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Nobody asked, does anybody need to read a book about networks? Does anybody want some book recommendations? Yes, please, all right. Um, so I would say, so the one of the, um, you're very welcome. Really glad you found it useful. And all, and also, I guess this is probably different than what you're expecting because it's very sciencey and evidence based rather than like the sort of soft and fuzzy um, versions of this you might have heard before. So I'm I'm glad you guys stuck with me. Um, so one of the uh, like biggest thinkers in this space is a guy by the name of uh, Laszlo Barabasi, and he wrote a book. Um, which I will throw into the chat, um, that gives a really useful overview of all the different ways that networks drive outcomes for us. Um, and so that one is great. I find it, it's called Link. Um, he has a number of them, but this one is probably, uh, probably the most like accessible and broad in terms of its coverage. Um, if you're more interested in the healthcare implications, then there's a doctor who's really steeped in this place called uh, Nicholas Christakis. Um, and he, I would say this book is more about health and wellness, um, how, and maybe not as delightful a read as the other one but does has a, have a lot of really interesting examples about how this shows up in the context of, of medical care and, and health care. Um, maybe those are the two that come to mind right now. Um, but if there are people who are interested in um, community building or the sort of the role of community 
in driving value for an organization. That's sort of a different rabbit hole, but um, but there's some really great, great books in that space. Um, and of course, you're welcome to reach out to me separately. I will just write my email address in the chat um, and I will get back to you. Um, although it's time delay, so I am in Hong Kong right now, um, but, uh, but I will get back to you and, and make some specific recommendations if that'd be helpful. There we go. Any last minute thoughts or comments? You're very welcome. I don't know if you guys, do you guys typically share the presentations? Because I can yeah, provide we have you guys it available the on the YouTube. People need to ask for the link though, it's not public, but happy to forward it to anyone who needs it. Okay. So I, I'll share the PDF with you guys afterwards so you have it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you guys too. I can I can give you five minutes back. Thank you so much, Eric. I don't know if you can hear me because I'm out in the office now, but thank you so much. That was a really good session and I hope everyone has a lovely rest of their day. Yeah, thanks, I can. Take care, perfect. Right. See you later, everyone. See you, bye.